call the 2016 meeting of the Faculty Assembly to order. Welcome to all of our honored guests and to our regional campus at WVU Institute of Technology who is attending remotely. We're also very glad to have our colleagues from Potomac State College here in person with us today. Uh, the proceedings of the meeting are live streaming and can be followed at webcast.wvu.edu. My name is Lena Mayner and I'm the chair of the Faculty Senate for this academic year. The Faculty Assembly is a superset of the Faculty Senate consisting of those faculty members who are employed full-time by WVU, those who report to an academic dean, and those who perform activities responsive to the academic mission of the university. According to the faculty constitution, the faculty assembly has one regular meeting per year, at which time the president reports on the state of the university. Following the president's report and an opportunity for discussion, Faculty Senate Secretary Alan Stoltenberg will discuss proposed amendments to the faculty constitution. Following that discussion, there will be a brief break, after which time the Faculty Senate will reconvene for its regular meeting. Uh, before the president's report, we will have a brief video. I now recognize President E. Gordon Gee. So um, thank you all for being here today. Aren't we blessed to have a great uh, group of people that do such a wonderful job in representing this university? That video is just outstanding. So give them a round of applause, would you please? And as, and as you can see, uh, West Virginia University has been a whirlwind of accomplishments. They, that was sort of a year put into about three minutes. Uh, um, with all the new initiatives and critical partnerships, we have built bridges, we've closed gaps and stacked hands to move this institution um, in a new direction. Because despite all the gloom and doom of this strange political season, we should believe that our world's best days lie ahead. And despite the issues bedeviling our state, we should believe that West Virginia's best days lie ahead. And despite budgetary challenges, we, should believe that our university's best days lie ahead. We should believe that because we have applied laser-like focus to what really matters, our core land-grant mission to reinvent education, healthcare, and prosperity for West Virginia. Our priorities drive our progress. Under prosperity, consider entrepreneurship, which is an increasingly important economic engine. In 2015, startup firms created 1.7 million jobs, or 60% of the total employment growth in the nation. This year, we nurtured entrepreneurship and economic development through our launch labs here in Morgantown and in Beckley. Our new Women's Business Center, funded by the U.S. Small Business Administration, and our Health Sciences Innovation Center, a home for biomedical startup companies. 
Consider workforce readiness. The skills employers seek are changing. According to a 2014 survey, only 7% of hiring managers found that job seekers had the ideal skill set their industries require. This year, we forged partnerships with Boeing, the U.S. Army Special Forces, and Pierpont Community and Technical College to build a workforce with in-demand skills. We also launched new majors and certificate programs to prepare our students for growing career fields from the music industry and entrepreneurship to data marketing, communication, and craft beer tourism. Very interested in that. Under education, we made Project 168 the blueprint for our student experience, one that includes personal and professional development, community service, and leadership opportunities. And this fall, we see three powerful signs that our student success initiatives work. Enrollment, retention, and academic quality are all rising. We have reversed a decline in overall enrollment and made progress in building a more diverse campus. First-time applications from underrepresented students were up 70% this year, and the number of admitted underrepresented freshmen rose by 27%. Across the West Virginia University system, our total enrollment has increased. For the first time ever in our history, we had the largest freshman class with more than 6,000 students. Our divisional campuses played a critical role in this increase. Both WVU Tech and Potomac State College also welcomed larger freshman classes this year. And in its inaugural year, WVU Beckley exceeded our expectations by enrolling nearly 200 students. In Morgantown, international student enrollment increased to more than 2,200, and I fully anticipate that number to increase significantly with the arrival of our new Vice President for Global Strategies and International Affairs, William Brustein. Under William's direction, we will exponentially expand our global footprint, engaging with scholars and students from all nations. In addition, we welcomed the largest incoming class with the highest high school GPA in history. Our honors college numbers have surged to include about 18% of the freshman class. And once they arrive on campus, our talented, our talented students are flourishing. Last spring, our students earned an unprecedented 30 national scholarships, including Goldwater and Udall Awards. In the past five years, the number of our students applying for major scholarships through the Aspire office has more than tripled. Global academic competitions also brought out the best in our students. For the second year in a row, our student team won the level two competition for the sample robot return challenge, part of NASA's centennial challenges. The team brought home a $750,000 prize, the largest NASA has awarded in its five year history with the challenges. Our student soils team uh, brought home two titles from the National Collegiate Soils Contest, the overall team championship and the individual championship for senior Katie Stutler. And six honors college students traveled to the Netherlands for the European International Model United Nations Conference, where junior Lauren Griffin was named distinguished delegate in the Human Rights Council. Our students succeed because our faculty members are awakening them to the fact that knowledge and hard work produce solutions. For example, Jingbo, uh, Jingbo Lu in mechanical and aerospace engineering is developing a fuel cell capable of converting natural gas into electricity or liquid fuel in, the single, uh, in, in a single step. Prevence Fomori in computer science and electrical engineering, and Nigel Clark, our provost for WVU Tech, are creating an engine to produce electricity for the home of the future. Both projects, by the way, earned awards from the U.S. Department of Energy's ARPA-E program, which funds literally only the best and most innovative ideas. As a leader in water research, our university has created the Institute of Water Security and Science, establishing a strong cross-disciplinary research network to shape the future of water resources and stewardship. Our leadership on energy and water issues even stretches across the equator to South America. 
Our Energy Institute has teamed up with the Ita Itaipu Dam in Paraguay and Brazil, one of the top hydroelectric power producers in the world. Faculty and students from at least four of our colleges and schools will collaborate on projects involving water resource management, water reclamation, solar power, and more. Clean air is an important uh, part of who we are and is as important as clean water and West Virginia University is on the cutting edge in developing power systems to protect air quality. One year after their work brought to light the biggest scandal in automotive history, our researchers at CAFE are launching a new vehicle and engine testing laboratory. This marks a big advancement in capacity for basic research and real world testing. Meanwhile, our neuroscientists are exploring another wild frontier, human mind and memory. We have consolidated all of our neurosciences research under a new West Virginia University Blanchett Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute with the goal of curing Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative di diseases. West Virginia's aging population faces many health threats. And reinventing West Virginia's future means attacking those threats head on. So that is what our scientists are doing in their laboratories and in their communities. More than one in 10 West Virginia adults has diabetes. Joseph McFadden, professor of biochemistry in the Davis College, is studying insulin resistance using a non-traditional model, a cow. This work could not only help dairy farmers raise healthier cows, but also improve doctors' understanding of type 2 diabetes in humans. Autism affects one in 68 West Virginia children. Susanna G. Poe, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, develops and leads our intensive autism service delivery clinic, which has gained, by the way, national attention for its success in training the next generation of autism professionals. Opioid addiction killed more than 700 West Virginians last year alone. Raleigh S Sullivan leads our comprehensive opioid addiction treatment clinic, which is expanding to battle this national epidemic. Dr. Sullivan is visiting doctors across the state and using teleconferencing to give physicians the training and support they need to treat drug addiction. To address these issues and more, we are collaborating with partners across the state, such as Marshall University and the Charleston Area Medical Center. We're also working hand in hand with coalitions such as Try This West Virginia, Sustainable Williamson, Healthy Harrison, and the Coalfield Development Project. These alliances are vital to the health of our communities and our citizens. And just last week, a national study of major academic medical centers and community hospitals ranked West Virginia University's academic medical center as the sixth top academic medical center out of more than 200. Give them a round of applause, would you please? That is. I want to underscore that. That is, again, remarkable. Uh, three years ago, we were ranked in, the, uh, I think, 79th or 80th. Uh, we moved to 18th last year to 6th. Uh, uh, and we're in good company with Mayo Clinic, uh, the University of Michigan uh, Medical Center, and NYU Langone Medical Center. Um, they fill our hot breath. And we accomplish this amidst record patient volumes and supporting our state through flooding of blizzard natural disasters. Our faculty scholars are also re re responding to human suffering on the global stage. More than 10, this is such a tragedy, it just boggles my mind, that more than 10 million Syrians have fled their homes in the wake of the deadly civil war raging in that country. Karen Kulkasi, Associate Professor of Geography, has been documenting the daily challenges and inspiring resilience of Syrian refugee women in Jordan. Her findings have demonstrated to others how displacement affects gendered performance, while also humanizing both the women and Syrian refugees more broadly. And in the Center for Big Ideas, in collaboration with the Rockefeller School of Policy and Politics, we continue to engage with communities and partners to listen, develop ideas, and put those ideas into practice. For example, we recently met with Senator Shelley Moore Capito to discuss the lack of broadband availability in the state of West Virginia. The absence of technology affects the education of our children, the ability to deliver health care, 
and the ability to drive economic development. We must and we must, must continue to work fervently to create solutions that benefit us all. In every discipline across our campuses, from the humanities, crafting the written word to lift the soul to the sciences, discovering the latest breakthrough, our faculty, students, and staff are fueling change. And people believe in our power. That is why the West Virginia University Foundation State of Minds campaign has been so successful, surpassing its billion dollar goal more than a year before it ends. And our $50 million Dream First scholarship initiative also exceeded its goal at nearly 51 million. The dollars donated by our alumni and friends resulted in nearly 700 scholarships being created for our students. 52 faculty chairs and professorships were launched. More than 210 research funds were generated to help in discovering the world's next big solutions. And these commitments will continue to benefit the university for years to come. This campaign has propelled our university into an elite group. Just 36 public universities have raised one billion or more in a private fundraising campaign. And we are not done. We are going to keep raising funds until the campaign officially ends in December 2017 and continue that pace after the campaign ends. But the question I pose for us today, for each of us, this is a question I've posed to myself over the last year, and that is for what purpose? For what purpose do we conduct research? For what purpose do we teach? For what purpose do we raise a billion plus dollars if it is to stand among the few who can tout such a claim, we did it for the wrong reasons? If we are teaching because it is what our contracts say we must do, we are here for the wrong reasons. If we are conducting research without thinking of how it can improve and impact people's lives, we are here for the wrong reasons. My friends, I've spoken many times about changing the arc of higher education. I've spoken about initiating new opportunities so that both the institution and the state can rise together. But it is time to stop talking and start doing, and we are. You all know that. Our 12 transformation teams have been working hard to think about how the university can increase efficiencies and improve effectiveness. For example, we have eliminated the need to encumber requ requisitions in excess of $25,000 in the state accounting system. We have consolidated five separate business offices into one serving five units. And to assist in the hiring process, we have reduced a 14-page PIQ form down to two and implemented a new electronic hiring process called WVU Hire. But it is now time to accelerate these changes. As someone who's been in the business for many years, I can assure you that higher education is going through a massive transformation. Some institutions will survive, some will not. And we have a choice. We can be at the forefront leading the change. We can be the architects of our own success, or we can be left behind. The latter, of course, is not an option for me, and it should not be an option for anyone in this room or this university. Change is not just a word. It is an action. It is indeed the heartbeat of this institution. And I realize this more than you can imagine, that change can be challenging. But let me make this point clear. The change we seek is necessary. It is necessary to ensure that we are making the right investments in education, in research, and in our talent. And real change comes from you. Let me say that again. And real change comes from you, not from me. You have to understand that change is vital. It is vital, and it is essential, and it is coming. Like a world-class athlete, we cannot rest on our laurels. 19-year-old rifle team member Jenny Thrasher, who won the very first gold medal of the Olympics, said later on in an interview, my goal has always been to be the best I can be, and that doesn't change no matter how many medals or what color the medals or where you get the medals. From the mouth of a 19-year-old. Being the best demands unwavering focus. It demands courage. It demands seizing the moment. At West Virginia University, this 
is our moment. And make no mistake, it is a formidable one. Decades of declining state support have culminated in recent years with $30 million in reductions to our base budget. And enrollment loss last year took its toll. Operating costs have increased, continued increases in tuition would reduce our competitiveness and erode our accessibility to West Virginia families. And our students' exceptional academic credentials means that more students are receiving tuition assistance through scholarships. In hard figures, our budget situation is this. By 2020, we must reduce spending by $45 million annually. However, this is not the time to retreat from our land-grant commitment or to curtail our momentum. It is our moment to reimagine, and I'll underscore that word, reimagine what West Virginia University can do and become. In fact, even if we had all the money we needed, I would insist we still be reallocating our resources. This is not a problem. It is an opportunity. I have been through the e exercise of budget reallocations more than anyone in this country. I have tried the strategy of woe is me. Let me tell you, it does not work. What does work is accepting only one goal, to improve quality. And we will improve quality by remaining positive, making the tough decisions, and becoming indispensable. So how do we become indispensable as an institution? We do so by focusing on our three pillars of education, health care, and prosperity. In the coming days and months, we will continue working to increase student enrollment and retention across the state. We are the first in the country to have a dean of completion. And we say that again. There are 4,500 universities in this country. They all have deans of admission, but we are the first to have a dean of completion. Joe Seaman. And we are working hard to deliver student success, including adding tutoring centers on all uh, campuses, streamlining, streamlining advising, and assisting students earlier when they begin to struggle academically. Furthermore, I do not want to see a single bright, young West Virginian leave our state to attend college. And as one WVU, we must leverage all of our statewide resources from Morgantown to Kaiser to Martinsburg to Charleston and Beckley to recruit and retain the best and brightest. I recently challenged the men and women of WVU Extension. Steve Bonanno is here and knows that. Our standard bearers, by the way, are Extension faculty throughout the state to help us in recruitment. And today, I extend the same challenge to each of you. Help young West Virginians fulfill their highest promise at West Virginia University. For those who choose our university, they will find rich learning and meaningful learning opportunities. Whether it be on campus, online, or through our ac Access uh, uh, WVU Early College Program, our university provides vast opportunities for academic and personal growth. They will also have the chance to grow professionally. At the Alumni Association, students can now join the Golden Blue Crew, a student alumni association that provides a professional development uh, series featuring alumni and, pro, uh, pro, and private networking events with our alumni. This interaction not only connects our students with an invaluable resource, but also establishes a rapport with the university that will last a lifetime. And when our students arrive on one of our campuses, they will find an institution that is inclusive and supportive. It was a joy, by the way, uh, to be at the grand opening of our LGBTQ Center last month. As the doors opened, it signaled to all that West Virginia University is a diverse institution that supports and appreciates individuality. And we will always have an environment where we can debate civilly, pro protest peacefully, and learn from others whose opinions and choices differ from our own. That is as it should be. To keep our best faculty and staff, we must invest in competitive compensation and change our cycle of recognition. We have talked for many years about the need to recruit the best talent and be willing to compensate accordingly. We also need to ensure we are re-recruiting the top talent we currently have. And we need to recruit everyone in this room every day. We must change the way we do searches and remove the constraints that impede the process. 
We have to fundamentally change our tenure and reward structures. Oh my. <laughs> there is so much to do if we want to reshape higher education. Under our second pillar of health care, we will continue to build the best programs in the country. Under the leadership of Vinay Boudoir, the WVU Health and Vascular Institute is gaining national recognition. Last month, Dr. Budwar became the first physician in the state to implant a new minimally invasive device for treatment of a leaking mitral valve called mitral regurgitation. This procedure does not require incisions in the chest or use of the heart-lung machine, so recovery time is improved. We are building strong programs not only here in Morgantown, but also in communities across the state. Just last week, we added the ninth hospital and the first in the Northern Panhandle to join WVU Medicine. We have also formed partnerships with Camden Clark Medical Center, Potomac Valley Hospital, and Jefferson um, Medical Center, to name just a few. And we are building strong programs for cancer care, women's health, children's health, and critical care. We will continue to lead the way in helping treat those fighting addiction, as well as those battling diabetes and obesity. We recently launched Good Measure, a program founded by West Virginia native George Benham. This program, by the way, and I saw it uh, last week, it is fabulous, combines a digital platform with human support to help make positive changes in eating and exercise behavior. By bringing creative concepts such as these to our state, we can begin to address the health needs of our citizens and affect real change. And in the coming days, we must pioneer our future by investing in strategic priorities. The programs, talent, and infrastructure that will enable us to reinvent our state's future and rebuild the prosperity that all 1.8 million West Virginians deserve. Though we have reached the Research One status, that does not mean our work is done. In fact, from my point of view, it is only just begun to main, in order for us to maintain that hard earned designation. Faculty research productivity must be at an all-time high. We will continue to invest in the institutes and centers that address our nation's most critical needs with the most innovative ideas. We will increase our doctoral productivity, and we will consistently develop the research that changes people's lives for the better. We will also work diligently to transform our state's economy. Now I realize that may sound daunting, but I assure you it is an era where we can be a good partner. By leveraging our expertise, we can bring the necessary entities together to examine new avenues for economic development. We will grow our partnerships with federal government agencies as well as with NGOs and businesses. We will listen to our communities and then together create a plan that meets their needs. Investing in our core mission also means jettisoning activities that fall outside that core. Recently, with the dedication of the NAS Sculpture Garden on the Evansdale campus, an old joke comes to mind. A man asks a sculptor, how do you make a statue of an elephant? And the artist replies, get the biggest granite block you can find and chip away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. <laughs> so we need to chip away at everything that does not look like West Virginia University and the university we envision. But let us also remember what I have said to you on many occasions. We must move like a ballerina, not an elephant in a tutu. Transforming an institution is the responsibility of the whole. It is my responsibility, and it is your responsibility. That means training ourselves to see the big picture. It means looking at everything with new eyes. It means harnessing the power of collective vision by seeking input from faculty, staff, and certainly our students. That is why I encourage you to frequently visit our Bureaucracy Busters website. Not only can you submit your own ideas and questions, but you can monitor what we are doing. As a university, we have been making significant strides in becoming more nimble. We have implemented new programs and procedures. We have made difficult decisions. And we, the collective we, by the way, it is not the imperial we, it is the collective we must continue to make those decisions if we are going to accelerate and transform the landscape of, high, of higher education, if we are going to thrive as a university and not merely survive. 
We all must be active participants. I want every person at West Virginia University, no matter their roles, to feel empowered to make this institution worthy of our city, our state, and the world beyond. Together, we must lead West Virginia University into a new era of a land-grant university that brings renewed life to our original mission and set a standard for others to follow. Which brings me back to for what purpose, the question I asked earlier. This summer, among some of the most difficult circumstances imaginable, we learned anew how compassionate, courageous, and united the people of this state can be. When floods ravaged southern West Virginia in June, everyone reached out to help, including our students, our faculty, our staff, and our alumni. We raised funds, which alumnus Ken Kendrick, by the way, augmented with a $500,000 cha challenge match. Through the organized efforts of the Student Government Association and the Center for Service and Learning, we immediately collected and delivered supplies to flood-stricken areas, and we helped with cleanup. Our forestry department helped clear fallen trees, freeing up access. WVU Medicine caregivers provided vaccines and other medical assistance. Reed College of Media faculty and students helped rebuild hope through the intimacy of photography. Our football team donated uniforms, and the pride of West Virginia performed at the State Fair in Lewisburg, because raising spirits is as important as raising money. In the face of enormous adversity, we renewed our purpose, and pharmacy student Rebecca Bern uh, Veranu did the same. And she scrolled through her Twitter feed this summer, uh, a frequently recurring hashtag caught her eye. The hashtag was WVStrong. And it led Rebecca to stories of lives devastated by flooding, stories of mountaineers uniting to help their neighbors, stories of rebuilding, renewal, and hope. These stories inspired Rebecca so profoundly that she wrote a song called West Virginia Strong. Mon Hill Records, our student-run record label in the School of Music, recorded the song. It is available on iTunes and from other digital music services, and Rebecca is donating every cent she receives in royalties to help the victims of Southern West Virginia floods. I am so pleased that Rebecca is with us today. By the way, we sent a note to get her out of class. <laughs> and she has graciously agreed to share her song with us, so Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rebecca to the stage. Thanks again for getting me out of class. <laughs> this is the acoustic version of my song, West Virginia Strong. Told 
Virginia Shore. Yeah, we West Virginia Shore. You know, we're so very proud of you. I tell you what, uh, uh, there are a lot of good pharmacists. There are very few good singers. <laughs> if I were you, I'd change majors right now. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. And I think we can all agree that Rebecca's music is inspiring. It really is. And just as we were inspired to come together to assist our fellow West Virginians with flood relief, let us bring to bear the same resilient spirit to assist with opioid addiction, our state's economic challenges, and our students' paths to success. Whatever the opportunity may be, if we always return to our purpose, if we ask ourselves, why am I here? What can I do to help? How can I be indispensable to the mission of this institution? I firmly believe we can transform West Virginia University in this state we all call home. I firmly believe that we will also be West Virginia strong. So I thank you very much for being here today, and I'm now going to take questions from all of you and uh, look forward to, uh, to those. By the way, I know some people uh, from WVU Tech and others have uh, sent in some, uh, some questions, so, and we've got some uh, microphones here. so. Are there any questions? Let me see. I think I think I've got the first one up there. I just saw that it had, it arrived. The, the the number the first question I've got is we just raised a billion dollars um, for the campaign. Why aren't you uh, using those monies to help with the budget situation? Because I've spent it all. <laughs> How does that sound? No, I um, <laughs> I think that I think we all know that. Um, Supporting our institution with private dollars is, is enormously important. In fact, the difference between a good university and a great institution is the kind of financial support we can receive. As you know, um, for many years, of course, we thought about uh, universities, public universities, as being funded by the public. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that is no longer the case. Uh, uh, we have uh, about 13 or 14 percent of our budget, which comes from the state of uh, West Virginia. When I was here the first time, it was about 60 or 70 percent. Obviously, I did a great job uh, in, uh, in advocating for the institution. But so what we have to understand is the fact that uh, private support is enormously important. But the difference is the fact that this private support comes to support very particular projects. We cannot use it for the state's general fund or for supporting uh, the general issues of the institution there for particular uh, dollars that are ra raised in a particular way. Nonetheless. They are extremely important. They allow us to give scholarships to the best and brightest. They allow us to give chairs to our faculty. They allow us to support uh, the kind of uh, resource allocation that is necessary to uh, build a great institution. And from that point of view, that campaign has been enormously important. And I will also say it's been enormously successful. But I appreciate the question. What questions, what other questions can I answer for you? Oh, come on, These are, this is going to be easy. Do I have to ask myself a question? I have over a thousand bow ties. There you go. Yeah. What are there any other que are there questions? Um, well, I see. I, I have another question here, um, which says um, that came in uh, on our thing. Wh what does that say? There it is. Okay. It says, "I uh, have you heard? Uh, I have heard you mention several times that you want to restructure." Uh, tenure and recognition. What exactly does that mean? Well, this is one of my favorite topics. The provost will go crazy every time I talk about this, but but I do. And that and and, and boy, there are two of you. There's only one of me. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I didn't realize this. There, that, that, that I've got, I've got two of them up here doing, uh, doing this. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, this is the issue of uh, one of the ma major issues of the times, and that is the fact that we have, we have um, about twenty thousand faculty and staff across the system of the institution. Um, we have thirty-three thousand students. And the issue for us is how do we make each of those individuals feel that they are rewarded, recognized, and valued? Um, I think that the way that we have structured uh, our, uh, our reward and recognition um, approaches at this institution and every other institution I've served really does not do justice to all of our individuals because, for example, we find that uh, there are some people who are really good in one area but not so necessarily uh, consistent in other areas, but yet they get, uh, they get stymied into certain places. We have, we have wonderful uh, faculty who are teaching faculty here and, they're, and they're, uh, they're given that designation, but yet we pay them only 80% uh, of what we pay our, our other faculty. There should be no differentiation. There should be a, a, an understanding that what we're trying to do at this institution is we're trying to build um, an opportunity for every person to achieve. We are unlike some of the other institutions. When we hire someone here, we expect them to achieve. If they don't achieve, it's our problem, not theirs. We have to work together in that regard. And so coming up with multiple ways to uh, reward people, multiple ways to recognize their value, I think that that strengthens our institution and makes us unique. There are very few institutions in the country that really do recognize and value each of the individuals in, uh, in that institution. University of British Columbia is doing an excellent job. There are several other places that really do do that, but I think that that is an opportunity for us to really build a spirit of great quality here. And by the way, some of the arguments are, well, if we don't do what they do at Harvard or Yale, then we're going to be out of the mainstream. My view is that they're out of the mainstream. Um, and I say that very, very clearly because of the fact that having been a, an Ivy League president, I know what they do is they hire young people. They say, look to your left, look to your right. One of you is not going to survive, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a Darwinian rule. I think here that we need to do uh, things differently. And I know we're working on it, but we really do need to move aggressively to make a change in the way that we recognize every individual at this institution and make certain that we hold ourselves to a high quality in, in, in doing so. Questions? OK, there we go. Great. Hi, Dr. Gee. Hi. Um, so we spoke a little about being more strategic with all the budget cuts and the budget constraints. Where is the strategic priorities for the institution going to come from? I know there were the mountains of excellence in recent years. Are, where are those decisions coming for, from on where we're going to focus our energy on? I know enrollment's come up, but where's that coming from your leadership on there? Well, uh, you know, first of all, I think that, uh, and if the provost were up here, she would say that we spend a lot of time in consultation with our faculty colleagues and with others to take a look at, at, at three things. One, where are we really good? And we need to continue to sustain that. I mean, uh, you, you know, there might be areas that if we started West Virginia University over again that we wouldn't do, but yet we, if we're really good, forensics is, is an example. Our, our biochemistry programs, our, our programs in astrophysics, I mean, we are wonderful there. So therefore, you support the things that are really good at an institution and you continue to do that. Secondly of all, you have to have, and this is how you prioritize, secondly of all, if you're really a world-class institution, you have to do certain things well. You have to have a strong English department. And the reason is, is the fact that, uh, that having uh, strong programs in the humanities are the essence of being able to grow our, our programs in the social sciences and other areas. So you have to be strong in that area. You have to have a very strong program in mathematics because that's essential to the sciences. So you take a look at those things that are building blocks. Then the third thing is what are, what are the things that we shouldn't be doing and how do we prioritize that versus the things that we're uniquely positioned for? You know, you know I'm always struck about uh, the fact that West Virginia is a unique state in the middle of, uh, of a vast sea of people. We're within um, a day's drive of two-thirds of the American population, and we haven't really taken full advantage of that. And I do get highly irritated, just as one example, when I hear people say, well, isn't it wonderful we're close to Pittsburgh, Chicago, or New York? And I would prefer to have a say, isn't it wonderful that they're close to us and they can come and spend their money and their time and their effort here? And, and growing programs that are really uh, of, uh, of quality and effort uh, that, 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 that play to the qualities 
and opportunities that we have in the state. So that's the way that we have to prioritize. Do the things, continue to support the things you do well, continue to uh, support the things that you must do well, and then take a look at things that are unique and different. We need to be a blue water institution. We don't need to be on the, on the side trying to look like every other institution. We need to be out there selling our ship of state in a much different way, I think. Questions? Yes. <laughs> you had one, your shot. Now okay. try again, OK? So you spoke about a transformation in higher education. So obviously, a big buzzword lately has been you know, the Airbnb, the Ubers, and how those have just transformed those industries on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Where do you see education transforming? Where, have it, where has it already started? Well, I, I, think that, um, I think that the transformation is going to be in the way that we organize ourselves. And I think, that, and by that I believe, uh, many of you know, and I've said this before, I think that uh, I think the day of the siloed institutions and the days of the tribal conspiracy are over. I think that what we have to do, and, and this is my point, we hire a young person, where are you, by the way? I'm at the Columbus Regional Airport Authority. Okay, Columbus, great, Ohio. great. So, uh, by the way, great air airport. So what, 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 I would, what I'd say is we, we hire young people to come into this institution. One of the reasons they come here is the fact that they want to, uh, they want to come to a place that is an academic cafeteria where they can connect, where we can have the physicians and the physicists laying down with each other like lambs instead of like lions. But, but, and so they come here, they think about running across the spectrum of intellectual life and making those kinds of connections, Airbnb, Uber, a variety of other things. But instead, what happens is the fact that we have a tyranny of the gerontocracy. So those of, those of us who are older, I may be the oldest person in the room, those of us who are older say, but we've always done it this way, so you have to follow our lead. We really do need to empower and, re, and reinstate the notion that A, our young people have much to, our young faculty have much to contribute, and B, that we really do need to organize ourselves so that we can move across the institution. The more that we get rid of fences and barriers, and the more that we move to, uh, a, to move from a vertical to a horizontal institution, the faster we're going to transform ourselves. And then we need to be a hybrid institution. By that, I mean we need to take full advantage of all the technologies. We need to control it rather than it controlling us. And, the, and, and we need to make certain that as we build a strong, uh, uh, strong campus-based program, that we're taking full advantage of all of the opportunities that exist out there so that we can be very connected in many different ways. One last question, and I'm going to let you all run. Any other questions? Seeing or hearing none, ladies and gentlemen, have a great day. Thank you very much. <laughs>